Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Take 15 podcast. I'm Lauren, and I'm so excited about today's episode. It's all about bubbles, more specifically, stock market bubbles and whether they even exist. My guest is David DeRosa, author of Bursting the Bubble, Rationality in a Seemingly Irrational Market, a new monograph from the CFA Institute Research Foundation. The book poses two main questions. Is there convincing empirical evidence that bubbles exist? And do the theoretical concepts that have been advanced for bubbles make them plausible? One thing is for certain, the term bubble is a powerful, emotional word that can skew our perceptions of reality. I found the conversation with David fascinating, and I hope you do too. David DeRosa, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. So I'm very excited to chat to you today. I think this is the first time I've had someone on the show who has talked about a bubble insurgency. So I'm kind of thinking uh, of you as a, a, a counterinsurgent when it comes to, to bubbles. Well, uh, but first, that's what I am. Okay. Well, first of congratulations. I, you have a new book, and I believe this is your 10th book, yeah, if we count book. second and third editions. Yes, and counting one book of photography. So wonderful. So we're going to spend uh, most of the show today talking about bubbles. And when we first were chatting about this, you had said, well, you thought this, this project would take you about a, a year. And four years later, you end up with this, this book on bubbles. So just walk us back a little bit in time. So you thought it would take a year, but it didn't take you a year. What, what happened along the way? Well, uh, what I didn't know when I started this project is just how much has been written in support, uh, some of it in contradiction to the idea that let's let's do it at the stock market level, which is where most people think there are bubbles. And I really uh, have to say that I was continually shocked at finding new sort of veins of the academic and popular literature that uh, ascribe to the existence of bubbles. And um, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I started really going back to the most basic uh, or, the, or the most fundamental principles of, of finance. So I ended up rereading um, virtually the entire field. And, uh, but there were parts, um, maybe in the behavioral areas, that I, I had not really delved into that much. The biggest surprise of all was that there was now there is now a branch of mathematics, if maybe applied mathematics, you could say, that talks about bubbles. And these are articles that are written in mathematics journals, and they really don't talk about finance papers or economics papers. Maybe they'll reference Black Scholes. That's it. Um, and it's they're all written the way mathematicians write papers and you know, theorem proof. And uh, I was very surprised to find that they would be interested in this topic, but there, there's a wealth of papers on bubbles uh, in, in that area. So the big question obviously is if there's a wealth of material out there, sort of what makes your book different? And I'm gonna give it away a little bit in, this, in that the title is mm -hmm. Bursting the bubble, so right. that that gives our listeners a bit of a clue. So I'll play devil's advocate here. Um, are you saying there are no bubbles? No, I, I really never said that, and I really could never say that. And I can't. You know what else I can't say? I can't say there are no unicorns either. Um, okay, but what I can say is that the uh, empirical work that's been done to allegedly prove there are bubbles and irrationalities in the market is questionable. And some of it is outright, has errors in analysis. Um, other times, um, and this is the best of it, right? Um, people who claim that they have found bubbles, turns out there, there are perfectly rational explanations. So you don't really need, you don't really need uh, bubble theory. You have good old neoclass, neoclassical 
rational arbitrage theory that can explain these phenomena. There are other times where, where there's just outright errors in analysis. And then if you look at the historical stuff, which is at the back of the book, the last couple of chapters, you'll see that these famous bubbles like tulip mania, the Mississippi scheme, and uh, the South Sea uh, Corporation bubble, that this is just error. This is just simply errors in historical analysis. These these never were bubbles. They're they are they're pretty much misunderstood. And in that sense, I'm confirming work by Peter Garber and and uh, and others. But I'm extending it. So I just want to make sure that I've got this right in my head, and so that the audience that who's listening gets this right. right as well. So essentially, you're saying that. Um, Bubbles are kind of either historically inaccurate, so they right. do bad history. Right, um, like tulip or, mania. Like tulip mania, okay. So things that are ascribed as bubbles are actually just incorrect analysis. Um, and then thirdly, things that appear to be bubbles are in fact rational phenomena. I'm saying that there are perfectly good, rigorous, rational okay. explanations so that okay. you don't need the bubbles. You can stick with rational theory. So I, again, I I know that I'm being quoted. People are saying, or, or, or people say, well, Derosa says there are no bubbles. I, I never I never said that. I can't say that. And by the way, most of the book is about the stock market. There was another chapter that, just because we had to get the book done, there was another chapter that did the same analysis in the foreign exchange market, and I'm hoping to publish that separately and a similar conclusion. So, uh, you know, do, do, all this stuff about bubbles, um, you know, it came about because of the dot com or, or something like that. And people say it's, it's impossible that those valuations could have been rational. Well, it turns out they were rational. Um, and that's a series of papers that I go into on uh, Pasteur and Veronese. And there are many other things like that, where if, if you... Uh, if you analyze these things correctly with good models, you'll see that they're they're really work. There's no need to call them bubbles, right? There's no because it probably didn't even happen that way. So if they're not bubbles, what do you call them? <clears throat> Rational pricing. Okay. So look, let's look at this, right? Um, for the most part, many of us of my generation got into economics and finance, partly because of Paul Samuelson's textbook, great textbook, but also because of a book by John Kenneth Galbraith on, on the 1929 crash. And people have this idea that the stock market crash and that caused the depression. Well, no, it, it, it couldn't have happened that way. It was after almost a decade of incredible profitability the market's always looking ahead, and it sees the Great Depression. So it crashed. What caused the Great Depression? I don't know. I don't know that anybody does know that. I mean, some people talk about monetary policy, and that's convincing. But it wasn't the stock market crash. The stock market crash was anticipating this economic calamity. So many of these things are simply the market anticipating. So the causality runs the other way, right? So perhaps the most famous bubble in history is uh, the Dutch tulip mania. Yes. Um, but you argue that that wasn't actually a, ba uh, a bubble. Right. Just explain that for the audience, how you explain what happened there. Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I've, I've got this, these great papers by the economist Peter Garber. And there's also uh, a book that came out in the last couple of years by, a, by an excellent historian, uh, Anne Goldcar. And what Goldcar can't find the tulip mania. Um, it's like if if it happened at all, it was among two dozen people. And uh, so the this where did it come from? Where did this idea of tulip mania? It came from a series of government pamphlets published in the 17th century, warning people about speculation. But the hard data uh, shows that tulip prices just pursued a normal path of a new flower being introduced. And, and, and they're, sell, they're transacting in a, in a special class of tulip bulb. They're not, they're not doing the flowers. So 
there's this idea, and a lot of this comes from Mackay's book of extraordinarily, extraordinary popular delusions in the madness of crowds. And a very small piece of that book, there are just three chapters that cover um, what we would call bubbles or what he called bubbles. And the rest of it is all stuff on the Crusades and haunted houses and um, things like that. Well, uh, the, the fact is there is no legitimate, no real evidence that that there was uh, any kind of a phenomena like this at all. And uh, it's just not there. You know, it's just not there. And the, when, if you look at the last couple of chapters of my book, I try to trace all the stuff of the, the stories, the incidental stories and things like that. And it, there's, no, there's no solid evidence. that. It, then there's this idea that Holland went into this deep depression after the tulip mania. And that, that's just contrary to known fact that Holland was in a golden age. And he has this popular idea that uh, people went crazy over tulip bulbs, certain tulip bulbs. And that it, it's not there in the historical records. I should just remind uh, listeners that in the show notes, you will have a link to David's book where you can go, go in and download it and read it in full. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in bubbles and bubble theory, um, this is the book that you should be, be reading. So when we were speaking sort of, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to prepare for today, I sort of asked you what your, your favorite chapter was. And you said the most fun to write was this one where you were sort of debunking tulip mania. Uh, but also you spoke about John Law. Tell us that story a little John bit. Law. Uh, I got introduced to John Law, like so many things of these ancient, of these first bubbles through uh, Peter Garber's work. And then I started doing further investigation of what he was doing. And it's like France had fallen on hard times after the death of Louis XIV, because the Sun King left the place broke. And the, the, the heir was the grandson, who was uh, five years old or something. And uh, the regent, the Duke of Orleans, brought in this incredible uh, Scotsman named John Law to put France right. And he had this incredible scheme of essentially privatizing the assets of France in exchange for uh, recasting the government debt with a lower rate. And uh, he introduced paper money into France. And I think John Law was a genius. However, the French government took advantage of this and started printing money like crazy. So we had an explosion of money. And I'm not sure that John Law liked that or could even stop it. But that's what more or less brought the whole thing down. But John Law was an, in, was an incredible character. I mean, he had the run of France, right? He, he was the head of the central bank. He collected the taxes. Uh, he, he was privatizing the state assets. So when the people talk about the Mississippi scheme, that just happens. It's a funny name, but it refers to the... France's land in the North America. And since it was near the Mississippi River, that's why it got called that. And again, uh, you can construct uh, a very rational um, uh, framework for understanding what happened to John Law's company and why the shares went up and why they, why they crashed. And uh, you don't have to have this as uh, an irrational explosion of enthusiasm with uh, maniac speculators fighting for shares, um, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, really like. I mean, the king was the was the was the chairman of the company, so it it couldn't have been that. It couldn't have been that uh, wild a scheme. So I imagine a few people in the industry must be bristling with some of the things that you're saying. Sure. When we were chatting, you know, you said you're taking issue with some of the the most famous people in the field: Keynes, right. Samuelson. Yeah. Schiller, yeah. Uh, Kindleberger, Melchiel. Right. Let's talk a little bit about, about Schiller because that's that's an right. interesting story as well. Well, uh, and you know, this is all just people talking about ideas. There's nothing I, I I don't have anything personal in this. I mean, it's just ideas. But the the main thing uh, with Robert Schiller, I mean, think the thing that for me that was the most explosive in his 
anti-efficient markets, anti-rational markets uh, work was the idea that he had a proof that, uh, an empirical proof that the market was too volatile to be rational. And uh, that really, that came out quite a while ago. Um, but it was, uh, I mean, it was still included in his, he included it in his Nobel Prize lecture when he gave his, uh, recently. And what I found, I mean, I was very troubled when I first saw the Schiller paper and when I first uh, realized the impact of what he was saying. Now, he, uh, so that's the, the basic premise is that the market is demonstrably too volatile to be rational. Now, he's not saying it's a bubble. Later on, he, he gets interested in bubbles, but he's saying it's, it's, it defies fundamental analysis and it's, this is proof that the market is not efficient in the, in the FAMA sense of security prices reflecting all knowable relevant information. And uh, when we started, you and I just started, I had in the front of the book, I said, well, there's a, sen a sense of a bubble insurgency that the bubble guys are uh, attacking uh, rationality and they're attacking the no arbitrage postulate. And what I'm saying is that, okay, let's look at what they're saying, but now let's look at the counter revolution because most of this stuff has been dismissed, or at least alternatives have been found. In the case of, of Schiller, it turns out that the construction of his famous time series, which is supposed to be perfect foresight security prices, is constructed mathematically in such a way that it has to be less volatile than actual prices. And it's, that's a quick explanation, but you'll see in chapter three that there's a lot more to it, and there are a lot more critiques of it. Schiller goes on from there, and Schiller says that stock prices may be efficient on a security-by-security security basis, but certainly not on the overall level of the market, and that efficient markets apply to that in one place, he says, it's one of the most remarkable errors of analysis in all of finance. And uh, you know, it just it just strikes me as, and furthermore, the market is dominated by fashions and fads. That's more more of his stuff. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think that none of that really really works. And I think that it's an interesting idea, but we have better stuff since then. So I don't think that, uh, with all due respect uh, to a very smart man, I just do not agree with him. He does some work on bubbles. He gets on the bubble bandwagon later. <laughs> but um, and I'll talk well, about well, Keynes, and Keynes may have kicked off the whole thing. And uh, when you read the general theory, you know, the general theory, 1936, I've read it four times now, and I always read it, and I just get so excited when I read it. I think, oh, wow, this is so great. This is so great. And then after I finish, I think, well, wait, what exactly did he say here? <laughs> and uh, we're still fighting over what Keynes said. As for the stock market, Keynes believed that it was a casino for insiders. And he never said bubble, but I'll bet you, I'll bet you he would have liked it. And so that there's a divorce between reality, uh, realistic fundamental value, and and security prices. And so that that's, of course, a lot of people will say, well, Keynes is talking about this, so it must be true. Well, there's a lot of things Keynes said that may not be true, and this is one of them. Um, you mentioned Malkiel. Uh, Bert Malkiel's a fine fellow and an intelligent man and a good writer. Uh, for some reason in his books, a ran, uh, his book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, he puts an enormous amount of attention on bubbles. And call, uh, he, he is extraordinarily convinced that there's the madness of crowds going back to uh, Le Bon, right, was the guy, the original madness of crowds guy, and that um, investors wanted to be taken from, they wanted to be separated from their money, that, uh, that the South Sea Corporation was a con job. And, and you know, he, he, he you know, he sold more books than I'll ever sell, but uh, I don't think that, 
I, I think that the academic Bert Malkiel is a different creature than the person who writes the popular books. So I don't really have a problem with the academic Bert Malkiel, but I think his random walk down Wall Street has a lot of things in it that are highly uh, 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 that are highly suspicious that are, that are wrong. And Kindleberger, Charles Poor Kindleberger, and later Robert Oliver joined him. Uh, that's all about bubbles and manias and things like that. And so that's sort of like the antithesis of, of my book. But, you know, and there's also a John Kenneth Galbraith book that just goes into all this. And he's really just parroting back what that guy Mackay wrote, right, 170 years ago. Um, uh, you know, you, uh, Short History of Financial Euphoria is the title of his book. And I don't think that any of these books have any of these authors have stopped to think that maybe it isn't true. Maybe it isn't true. And um, because I don't know, as I said, I can't prove there are no unicorns. I can't prove there are no bubbles. But I can tell you that there's not a lot of evidence. And if you really wanted to prove that there were stock market bubbles, you have a very steep hill to climb when you look at when you look at the analysis that's been done, it's extra, and when you look at the theory, it's extremely difficult to actually prove beyond a doubt that uh, the stock market is infested with these irrational bubbles. I just don't, I don't think that's been proven. Maybe true, but it hasn't been proven. So one thing seems very, uh, very clear is that the, the word bubble carries with it a lot of baggage. Oh, yeah. um, Bringing the discussion sort of from the, the 17th century and the tulip mania sort of forward to today, yeah. there are a couple of things that have been in the news recently that people may ascribe to being bubbles that I want right. to ask you about. So one of them is Bitcoin. And right, Bitcoin. how do you explain the, the significant growth in the value of Bitcoin? I can't. I, I haven't looked at it in the book and I haven't really delved into it. But um, I mean, maybe that is a bubble. I don't know. But uh, I also think that I have trouble at the beginning of even understanding why anybody wants a Bitcoin unless you're a drug dealer um, or, or, or a North Korean, uh, <clears throat> a North Korean uh, hacker. I don't know why anybody wants them. I don't know. I don't know what the what the fundamental value is. Uh, it's certainly an enormously volatile asset. So as a store of value, um, doesn't look very good to me. But I didn't look at Bitcoin. It's something I, at some point I will. And there are other things like that that appear to be um, bubbles. My topic was the stock market plus the three Mackay uh, famous bubbles. But I don't know. I mean, I don't own any Bitcoins. I don't plan on owning any Bitcoins. Um, it doesn't look like a particularly good store of value. Uh, I guess it's a uh, tax efficient in the sense that you won't get reported to the IRS, I guess. But I don't know why a Bitcoin would be worth $50,000. And I don't even know that you can actually get that money, right? I don't know that you can actually get that money. Uh, by the way, um, we're exercising a, a after the fact, a, you know, a post condition bias in this discussion, because there have been several other uh, e, e currencies that have crashed and burned, right? So we're, we're just looking at the one that, that survived so far. But there are many other ones that, that went to zero value. So it, the concept of that one of them would allegedly sell at these prices, um, Something maybe I should look into. I mean, I'll I'll be happy to right. put on my debunker hat and and go after it and go after that. <laughs> but I didn't okay. really look at Bitcoin and. Um, okay. So I know that in the book you didn't look at this, but I'm wondering if you can put your your debunker hat on just for a moment because there's been a lot of talk uh, in the media about. NFTs or non fungible tokens. Right. And of course, there was in the news um, the work of art by the artist known as Beeple that sold for $69 million right. at Christie's. Right. So I guess there was some question is there some sort of a bubble 
brewing well, in NFTs. No, I, I think that they're selling at prices that, I mean, it could be that people, that there's a tremendous demand for them and there's very little supply. It, you know, it just could be a scarcity thing that uh, the, the artists go in and out of, 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 of favor. And that doesn't mean that they're bubbles. So I think you got to be careful. What, what is a bubble? It's an irrational surge in price unrelated to fundamental value that subsequently and unexpectedly crashes and burns. That's one definition. Another is that it's just divorced from fundamental value. But if you think you can arrive at fundamental value for works of art, then you have missed a great career, uh, perhaps, because, I mean, you hear stories recently about uh, Van Gogh's paintings that were sold for pocket change, right? Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what determines the price of art. It's a good question. But um, I don't think that that means there are bubbles. I think that those are unique pieces of art, which there is no supply other than those particular paintings. And people look at it as um, people with a lot of money, you've got to have it. And so they bid it up. And, but that's not a bubble. That's demand. That's supply so and demand. And I, I hesitate to use the word bubbles here, so I'll use the kind of the scary air quotes, but two bubbles that I have lived through, uh, the dot-com bubble, which I believe you wrote about in the book, and of course, the housing bubble. Right. So how do you explain that to sort of lay people like me who are like, no, 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 there, there definitely was a bubble there. No, I, I, uh, the dot-com thing is in uh, chapter four. Uh, that's in, uh, yeah, chapter four. The answer to that is that uh, the valuation techniques that suggest there was a bubble in the internet stocks do not have firm footing. And that if you use a more sophisticated rational model, uh, a Bayesian model, you'll see that you can value the internet at its peak on March 10th of 2000. And you can also see why it, why it came off, why, why prices came off, and so why they came off so violently. So the answer is chapter four, which is kind of tough reading, but um, there are perfectly fine rational models that show why it is that those stocks would have had particularly high value and why that value would would uh, fade, not just fade, evaporate. And <clears throat> so that that one's accounted for. Housing. I think that whole episode was totally misunderstood. Um, and it, the, the biggest piece of misunderstanding comes down to this idea of that the subprime loan market killed the rest of finance. And let me just ask you this simple question. Let's say that you had <clears throat> four types of loan, four loans, right? Uh, how, uh, housing loans. And you had one that, that's very well capitalized on a nice piece of real estate and then one that's a little less capitalized. And then you go all the way down to the fourth one, and that's one that's, it doesn't, the, the borrower doesn't have a lot of money, doesn't have a lot of stable income. Um, it's maybe 100% uh, of, the, of the value or 90% of the value. It's in a dodgy area, right? Okay, so now all of a sudden, a big hulking recession comes along. Right, a big recession comes along. I don't know why, but it comes along. Okay, what's going to happen? That first mortgage that I mentioned, the so-called subprime, is going right into the tank. Right, right into the tank. Maybe some of the others, but that's the one that's going to go in. And to a to an unsuspecting person it looks like cause and effect. And so what I think happened like in 2008 is basically there was an enormous recession and it hit subprime simply because those were the riskiest loans. And then everybody from politicians to commentators saying, oh, those subprime guys, they killed us. They didn't kill you. They were the messenger, right? And 
Now, was housing a bubble? I don't know. Schiller thinks it was, and Thaler thinks it was, but I don't really know whether this was a traditional bubble just because it went up in price and then down in price and then back up in price doesn't mean it went through a bubble. A bubble is it something is, else. It's definitely a fascinating discussion. I just want to remind viewers that if you want to take a deep dive into, I guess, the counter revolution we take on bubbles, then I, I, rec you know, I highly recommend you download that link and read Thank you. Uh, the book. Um, so now we're, we're almost out of time. And so this is the, the sort of the fun part where I get to ask you the three questions that I ask all my guests at the end of the show. And the first one, it's a very easy one. That's what I call the ray of sunshine question. And I just ask you to think about or tell me one positive, long lasting change that you hope to see as a result of the pandemic. I hope to see that these new vaccines, many of two of two of which that we know of, that are based on messenger RNA, will lead to a new family of vaccines and other cures. So I look to the scientists and I am in awe of these people that they got this done so fast. So I think that. Basically, we are in the hands of the scientists and they have not let us down. But if they can make these vaccines, then I have to wonder what else these clever people have in the lab and where they're, what else they're going to do for us. But we owe, we owe the scientific community our lives in this one. We do. We owe a huge debt of gratitude, that is for sure. So that's the, so, that's the ray of hope that I see. That's a great one. So now we're going to change direction slightly. Um, you're going to take a trip to out of space, David, <laughs> and you're allowed to take one item with you. What do you take? I would take one of the works of classical literature. I mean, something that was um, something that I could read. Um, I, I would take something, you know, probably uh, from from the uh, golden age of Rome, probably um, Cicero, something like Cicero or um, Caesar or or the Aeneid, something like that. And you could put it another way: if God forbid I got arrested and got sent away to Supermax and to let me have one book, that would be it. <laughs> Yes. Well, I almost thought that you were going to answer that you take a camera because I should tell uh, our, our, our audience that you are an avid photographer. Yes. And one of the books that is in your, I guess, not in the 10, maybe it's the right. 11th, is a book about uh, photographs taken in Egypt. Yes. Um, so that was taken a long time ago, too. Yeah. Um, I, have, um, I have been involved in photography for probably since I was a graduate student, and at first uh, film photography, and then later I, and so the film photography days, I went to Egypt twice, and, um, you know, it's sort of like using uh, ASA 400 film in tombs, right? And in those days, you could just do anything you want. I mean, you, now they've got them all covered up with glass and not allowed to bring cameras in the tombs and things. But I, uh, I, I, I took a lot of photographs, and I found them. There was in 1982-83, and I found them a few years ago. I found the negatives, which I then digitized and started cleaning them up. And then I connected with an old classmate of mine at the College of the University of Chicago, who is an Egyptologist. His name is Ed Meltzer. And we went through all the photographs, and we uh, identified mostly Meltzer. Uh, identified everyone, everything, every god, everything in those photographs. And then after I finished scrubbing the negatives because they had, uh, they had deteriorated, um, I made it into a book. And um, so I self-published it. It's on Amazon. But um, that was, that's one of my adventures in photography. But I've done things like rent helicopters when you could and fly over Manhattan. Uh, 
and take pictures at night and um, open door helicopters, right? And uh, which probably was a crazy thing to do, but I did it not once, but twice. And I've been all over the world. So I've got pictures from all over. There, there is a free website, uh, derosa-photos.photoshelter.com. And uh, you'll, it starts out, you'll see a picture of, of, um, of Central Park. And uh, you'll see all the galleries. And the Egypt photos are there. All the Egypt photos are there as well. Plus things from all over the world, from uh, Iguazu, Iguazu Falls in uh, Brazil and Argentina and everywhere. I mean, from all over Italy, uh, um, all, over, all over the place. Great. So we have time just for our final question. And this is maybe my, my funnest question. And it's about superpowers. And you can only pick one of these two superpowers. It's either flight or it's invisibility. Whichever one you choose, you're the only person in the world that has that superpower. Which one are you going to choose? You and what are you going to do with it? Power? Yes. So you, I can either choose to fly or you can choose to be invisible. And what do you do with it? Mm. Uh, well, uh, I think that H.G. Wells wrote this book called The Invisible Man. And what happens to the invisible man is he becomes a criminal. He drifts in <laughs> uh, because he can't get caught, right? He starts murdering <laughs> people. So I'm going to go with flying. And uh, the answer is, the twofold answer is, I'm never going to wait in line at an airport again. <laughs> and the second is, uh, I'm not going to worry about uh, my carbon footprint, and I'm going to fly all over and take pictures. Well, take me with you <laughs> oh, in your backpack. <laughs> well, on that note, David, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you today. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. You're quite welcome. Thank you for Thanks. publishing the book, and thank you for the podcast. You've been listening to the Take 15 podcast from CFA Institute. If you haven't yet subscribed, you can do so on our YouTube channel or wherever you listen to the show. That way, you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed today's show, we'd appreciate a rating and review. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us too. And a quick reminder, this podcast isn't intended to provide expert advice on the topics we covered. If you need tax, accounting, or legal advice, please consult a professional. I'm Lauren Foster. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.